What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Yesterday, JWST released its first full color images and spectroscopic data. And I think it's fair to say that scientists around the globe were pretty excited about it. Now, the release represents uh, the first wave of full color scientific images and spectra the observatory has gathered and the official beginning of Webb's general space and science operations. But before we get to that, I have the pleasure of welcoming back one of my favorite special guests on the channel to discuss these images, Dr. Stephanie Millam. How are you, Stephanie? I'm fantastic. It is very, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you back. So just to remind people um, from before, Dr. Millam is a, a planetary scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and serves as the JWST Deputy Project Scientist for Planetary Science, working in the Astrochemistry Laboratory. So who better to give us a deeper insight into the images that we saw this week? So Dr. Millam, as we, as we kind of start, First thing, it would be remiss of me and, and rude of me, really, not to just ask you, how did you feel when you saw these images? What was your reaction to these fantastic new images? Um, I, I was speechless and actually I cried. And every time I've seen them since the first time I saw them, which was fortunately and luckily before <laughs> everybody else, um, how long, I cried. How, how long? Was, <laughs> how, how long? Um, so I... Um, I guess I got to see the first one um, maybe a week or so before. Yeah. And then they trickled in as they became prepared and ready um, for review. <laughs> <laughs> um, so every time I've seen them, even during the release yesterday, I was in with all the Goddard folks, mm -hmm. uh, the administrator and yep. everyone. And um, I was sitting next to one of my postdocs and I started crying and she just thought that was the funniest thing in the world. She's <laughs> like, haven't you seen them? And I was like, I know, but look how beautiful. Uh, yeah. The, so the, the first thing that you will notice in these images and the first thing that um, absolutely made me aghast was um, the resolution. Yeah. You can see the tiniest details and yeah. If you open up the high resolution images, yeah. just start zooming and zooming yeah. and yeah. zooming yeah. and zooming. And you will see crazy things that you had never even thought that the James Webb Space Telescope could resolve. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm still, I open up the pictures every once in a while, especially over the last few days. And um, I'm just blown away. Every, every time I look, I find something new. Yeah. And that that is the that is the really cool thing, isn't it? It's it's this idea that we're on the precipice of discovering so much more about our universe. What one thing that really struck me looking at these images, and I mentioned this to Michelle yesterday as well, it's sort of the most amazing tech demo at the same time as well. So I, I listened to um Amber Strawn's talk about uh JWST from Perimeter a couple of years ago, and she was talking about the major science themes of, of JWST. So looking at how galaxies came to came to form and evolve in the way that they do, looking as far back into time as we can to understand the evolution of the universe, looking at exoplanets and also stellar birth and death. The images that we saw, and you'll know this, uh, this answer for me, were they sort of selected by committee to make sure that we could see that all of those science themes were, were kind of up and running and being hit and, uh, Basically, that JWST is open for business on all fronts. One hundred percent. Okay. Um, so there, there was a special committee that was formed um, that uh, got together and had to come up with a list of objects um, using all of the science instruments, a lot of the modes, yeah. but highlighting and covering all of our science themes. Tick 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 tick. For and yeah. we had to do this. Um, for considering where JWST would be in the sky. Yeah. Um, so we can only see certain parts of the sky at given times of the year as we orbit the sun. Um, we only have access to certain things. So we had to consider where we were going to be. Um, so that automatically doubled, tripled, quadrupled the <laughs> list of objects. Yeah. 
Um, but even still, we actually observed more than just the ones that were released. Um, we observed multiple um, objects for a given theme. And then those were looked at with a preliminary analysis of this, this elite selection team. Mm. And they picked the best of the best to have for this first image release. So what that means is there's other images that were actually uh, taken and those will be released sometime in the very near future. Amazing. I've heard uh, I've heard little uh, rumors about Jupiter tomorrow. I don't know if you can confirm or deny those those rumors. You can't. Jupiter is out. Oh, is, is that um, already? Can actually see it. So we <sighs> um, we did some um, commissioning activities on Jupiter. Uh, I'll say some of the images mm. of Jupiter are out. Okay. Um, okay. Not the um, the data images mm. uh, so that you would get from the archive, but um, a version of those images have been published. Um, we right. have a commissioning right. report that was put out yesterday. Nice. Um, it's now on archive, so you can go and find that. Yeah. Um, Jane Rigby is the lead author. Um, there's, uh, there's a science also, performance. Uh, is it this 100%. one? 100%. Okay. So um, I got to write the solar system moving target commissioning report in oh, that wow. document. Nice. And um, I told them that the solar system didn't get an early release object. So we're putting Jupiter in this document. So figure one is Jupiter. Oh, wow. I did not, I did not know. Uh, maybe I can, uh, I, this, I, I've been, I've been like rushing to try and keep up with it. Maybe we can, uh, maybe we can see it when we, uh, well, we have a look in this document when it loads. The there's there's a couple of other Easter eggs in that document, so uh, I would encourage you to I am definitely, it. I am definitely <laughs> going to do. Don't worry. It, it's, it's so hard to keep up with everything that's coming up, which which gives you some idea of how amazingly this this telescope is working. That and that leads me on to the other thing I want to say about it, which is that it's kind of scary the speed at which you guys are putting stuff out because there's uh, there was a uh, there was a uh, there was a tweet this morning about this. Uh, some of these spectra taking six and a half minutes to take all of the images that we're going to, that we're going to discuss. I think Jane Rigby li likened it to doing them before breakfast in the, uh, in the live stream, the yep. ability for you guys to turn out all of this stuff so quickly. What was the time scale between everything being up and running and commissioned and having these images ready to ready to go? Um, so that's, that's a more complicated question that okay. maybe not as linear as you want it to be. Okay. Um, so we started taking the early release observation data as soon as modes were ready. Okay. So, um, if you followed along with the where is web stuff and we were ticking off the, you know, near cam yeah. imaging is now approved for science. Um, MIRI uh, spectroscopy has yeah. been approved for science. Um, so as each of those modes were enabled, um, we knew which observations that we wanted to do for the early release observations um, with those particular modes to, mm. to basically show our four science themes. And so we started doing those observations as we were able to. So they actually started a couple of weeks ago. Mm. And then we had to obviously wait for the last ones um, to kind of come in. Um, as that uh, particular mode or instrument was available. And so um, they were kind of scattered about during commissioning yep. <laughs> activities. Yep. And um, we completed our last observation before commissioning was actually finalized. Oh, wow. So um, that data had to go through, obviously, all the processing, the details. And then we had our you know, beautification um, <laughs> process of you know, making these image color, images colorized. Uh, so um, there was definitely a process, but all in all, the total time was just barely over a week um, of observation time, which is absolutely insane considering we released these five images, um, which are some subset of that total amount of time, because I told you there were other observations yeah. that actually yeah. happened. Um, and just to think of all of the amazing things that we can already see in that blink of an eye, um, imagine what the science is going to be that we're returning in two days in the next month, yeah. in the next three months, yeah. in the first year of science. Um, we're already overwhelmed with the amount of things that are that have come out. As you said, it's just amazing how much we've been able to turn around so quickly. Um, 
it's it's kind of scary. We've seen we've seen we're going to look at we've seen transits, we've seen spectra, we've seen deep fields, amazing uh, amazing stuff. So so let's let's dive in without without further ado. So the so the first image we got the the pleasure of seeing was the uh, the deep field image, which uh, which President Biden got a sneak peek on uh, on uh, Monday <laughs> Monday evening. I think yes. it was. He kept us yeah. waiting plenty of time to see it as well. But uh, I guess that's uh, that's his prerogative. So yeah, that's the nature of the White House. <laughs> <laughs> so what what exactly are we are we seeing in this image, and what why is it why is it so important? So this is this is Smax O seven two three, a gravitational lens. Is that is that right? Yes. So um, what this image is showing you in all of its glory is there is a cluster of galaxies in the center of the image, these bright white ones, yes. And the mass of these clusters is actually obscuring the, the galaxies and the light behind it, the same way Einstein told us that it would, and it's lensing that light, um, which is why some of them look like worms or, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, dolly uh, paintings yeah. <laughs> of melting clocks, yeah. um, which is, is even a more fun analogy, thinking of a melting clock and seeing back in time yeah. Um, yeah. some of these galaxies. Uh, one of my favorite analogies now. Um, but at any rate, so what we're seeing now is all these, I mean, there's thousands of galaxies in this image. A couple of stars, which are, you know, notable features in this image. They're the ones yeah. that look like that asterisk yeah. um but even some of the galaxies are bright enough that we're even seeing the point spread function which is which is pretty pretty fantastic um what i love 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 about this image is every single one of those tiny specks yeah. is a galaxy that you yeah. can blow up yeah. and you can actually see things you can see star formation happening in these galaxies can we, can we... you can see the colors varying you can see the shapes the structures yeah. it is mind-blowing how much detail is in this image and if you compare it to previous um observations of this field there, just go through no, and, and no try to match the dots <laughs> there, there's there's literally like no i think i've got the the old the old Hubble image, and and if you if you take sort of the big star here, the the uh, I think I think Paul Byrne called it the Beret Galaxy, and and yeah. the sort of three here, <laughs> and you sort of spin it on its side, you can sort of see um, the similar field. If I go to so we got this big star, we got the Beret yeah. and the, and the three. That in between, look at how much stuff there is in this image, and then we go back to what we had with Hubble, and it's uh, you know it's pretty yep. uh, it's pretty empty. It's it's a ridiculous amount of extra extra detail and, and going back to kind of what we said before this took i think we were told something like 12 and a half hours total Where... it was two hours per filter and, <laughs> and and the hubble one took something like 12 days which because hubble goes around the earth was like 25 days of actual kind of science time to actually take it and yet yeah. in in a, in such a tiny fraction of the time 50th of the time or something like that we've got this this stunning image. I've actually seen some people being disappointed that they they couldn't see the equivalent in terms of time of exposure. What what would we expect to see? Just just even more detail and even even more filled in these. Uh, this uh, garden, we I to... think it's going to start filling in the longer and longer we look. Um, you're going to start pulling out those fainter objects, sort of lingering in the background. Um, details may or may not start being better. Um, I don't I don't imagine the detail getting any more um, amazing than what it already is, yeah. um, just because the resolution is what the resolution is. But you're going to start seeing those fainter objects come out um, and pulling out that signal to noise in ways that um, will be absolutely incredible. The spectra that we acquired from this um, is it all the more amazing. This this is even cooler in my in my opinion as a as a scientist. So yeah, yeah. Uh, this is this is amazing. Yeah. We're seeing a thirteen point one billion year old galaxy that has That's oxygen. This, like, red, red jelly bean in in one in, in our in our image. I'm not sure where it is, but it's one of these little red jelly beans <laughs> that you can sort of see all over the uh, all over the image, and then they yeah. got the spectra of this. But this is telling us that we have, you know, multi-generation galaxies already at 13.1 billion yeah. years ago. So yeah. we're only a hundred, couple hundred million years into the actual existence of our universe. And here we are, we already have 
multiple evolutionary sequence of of stars and uh, you know atomic formation this is crazy and, and, and you say that because there's heavier elements in these, heavier in these elements. galaxies yeah. and therefore so, they must have come from star death previously it's it's going to take some time but our goal is to find these galaxies that don't have yeah. these higher order elements right so looking for the only hydrogen helium galaxies um so this is crazy this is i mean considering this is what's been you know um given some perspective this is you know a cosmic speck <laughs> of our universe so equivalent to the grain of sand held at arm's length as far I, I, I'm as i'm trying not know. to think of it as a particle physicist i immediately go how many atoms does it take to make <laughs> that thing it's like and then my brain just sort of thinks for a second and then just goes, no, no, we're, we're going to stop thinking about it. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. So um, we have a lot of sky to cover. <laughs> yeah. It's it's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. I, I really like this idea. And I think this is where astronomy has a, a real leg up, perhaps on my field of particle physics, is it, it makes us feel so small immediately when you see all of this image. To, to, to us you know we have different countries and, and you know different groups and things but in terms of in space we're all basically on the same tiny tiny pixel somewhere and looking yeah. out into space we're all exactly the same and on the same footing and i just think that's such a such a such a beautiful idea so the, the idea with 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 this i guess in terms of the science is that you can get this compositional data as a function of time because you can get it as a function of distance and also as a function of kind of position in the sky. So we can start to really have a think about the evolution of those, that composition over time. Is that, is that kind of the idea that we've, we've got with these spectra? Absolutely. And one of the, the fun, amazing parts about the James Webb Space Telescope and this particular image is the spectra we actually got from the multi-shutter array. So this is this giant array of um, little uh, windows that we can open and close. And you can actually collect spectra across this field wow. of a hundred unique targets at one time. That's ridiculous. And this particular image, we have spectra from 47 different galaxies that we took within this single <sighs> I, I I can't even like it's hard for people I think to understand it's hard for me as someone outside the field as well but I've got some sort of idea of being as how much data you're producing so quickly and look yeah how, I was saying to Michelle <laughs> yesterday look how clean it is it looks like a textbook diagram of here's what a spectra looks like it's not all over the place and there's bumps and weird things and you have to sort of go and look for the peaks you're like flat 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 peak flat peak 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 immediately yeah, it's, it's that physics experiment that you have when you're learning yeah. spectroscopy exactly. right where you look at the lamp and you get to see the light yeah it's and you time. do it in the lab and it just doesn't work and it's all a mess and the noise <laughs> is all over the place but well nothing but, works in a lab at any given time so but here it's just it's just it's just working so perfectly so that's that that's kind of the the first image and that's the um i mean it's just it's just working so beautifully it's um it's uh yeah it's absolutely absurd to be honest i mean but, this is this is what the telescope was built to do yeah. this is 100 percent why the james webb space telescope exists mm -hmm. is to study galaxies in just this manner and mm -hmm. um we're even more impressed at how well it's working so <laughs> we're, we're doing better than we ever had hoped and that's just it really is it really is amazing and and i guess we're going to get a lot of feed into our evolutionary models of, of the universe and uh you know some are going to have to be amended some are have to be updated and and yeah. some new ones are going to be made i guess i got a, a quick question in the chat was um will jwst so thinking about looking out to those deep regions um be able to give us any insight into the the problem with the hubble constant so i think there was an issue um with the how the expansion of the universe seems to look at different at different distances that came up recently I don't know if uh, if JWST will have any input onto that. That was a question. I am I'm certainly not uh, the expert in this field, but I can tell you that with the capabilities of Web, with the spectral resolution that we can do, with the sensitivity that we have, I think um, a lot of work is going to be done in that area. Um, if anything, only to you know give 
better error bars yeah, if we can yeah, even yeah. imagine getting better error bars in the I know, I, I know. <laughs> you, 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 you're gonna struggle you've got a pretty good uh noise uh, signal to noise ratio already but uh we'll, we'll we'll have a look i guess so the um the second one we got was of the uh the beautiful Karina nebula so i'll bring up the uh the actual picture from uh from web so this i must admit i don't know which one is your favorite but this is my this is my favorite I don't know which is my favorite. This is, I mean, they're all very uh, good, but I, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I this love was, this image. Though. This was like the sort of one that I would have as my as my screensaver. I've seen a lot of people on Twitter sort of sticking it on doors and mugs and on their oh, yeah. on their it's screensavers right as well. So, so this is a this is a this is a nebula, and I guess here the idea is that we're sort of we're, we're looking at, at stellar birth, right? It's a huge huge cloud of gas and dust. Is that is that right? Yes, yes. So um, what we're seeing here is sort of the edge and beginning of star formation and how that whole process works. Um, what I love about this, this image is it really shows you the complexity of, of stellar birth and all the things that have come out in this image alone of what we don't know and what we don't understand already. There's hundreds of questions that have already popped up just from this image alone, <laughs> just from the initials team. That can you give, can you give us object. like three of three of the top ones? I know we don't want to get into uh, hundreds and hundreds, <laughs> but, but I know from the, even if you look at the, the sort of old, the old Hubble images, they, they did have some in the infrared, but if, you, if you're in the visible, you can see this beautiful um, patch of the sky, these mystic mountains, but you can't really see inside, but with, right. with web looking in the infrared and, um, I mean, it's, it's like drawing back the curtain. You can see all those processes going on inside, how the gas and the dust interacts with those stars. Where are the stars in terms of the sort of clumps in the gas and, and how do they how do they start? Where, where are the big stars? Where are the small stars? We think we have all these answers, but there's still a lot of um, we have a kind of general idea of star formation, but not necessarily all the specifics. But but here it looks like you'll be able to really sort of draw out yeah. some patterns of, as to as to how these stars and where these stars form relative to the yeah. environment. Yeah, one of the really cool things in this image, um, which I, I love, and it just, it demonstrates the capability of Webb as well as the complexity of the system. So if you look just to the right of that big peak with the, the red star, there's another peak and it has sort of that yellow goldish yeah, area around it. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a protostar. And what we're seeing on the top is it blowing through that cloud. You can see that it almost looks like it's just puffed right through and you see a whole tuft of, of gas and dust that's kind of being blown out. And then the opposite jet that's going into the cloud sort of hits a wall yeah. uh, of dust and gas. Uh, it doesn't have, um, the power to actually punch through it on the bottom side um, yeah. because it's now facing a whole lot more uh, material. But um, this is just crazy that we can see these things. We can actually see that gas and dust getting blown out of the surface of this uh, huge mountainous cloud. Um, all the baby stars that have already formed are on the, the top sides, the blueward side. Yeah. And we can yeah. see the effects of those new stars and how it's actually eating away the material that's forming the other new stars within the cloud. If you go to the mid-infrared image, um, you can really see the infant stars that are, uh, or the little nebulous um, entities that are going to be stars within the cloud itself. Um, they're these beautiful right, bright red objects that you can really pull out with the mid-infrared. And that complements everything that we're seeing in this near-infrared image. We can see all the structure, the gas, and how it's moving, how it's evolving, um, and comparing that to the mid infrared image where we can see these new, you know, baby little uh, stars <laughs> being formed and how that environment's actually impacted. Um, this image alone, um, the whole combined mid infrared and near infrared, as well as the spectroscopy, is going to give us just all kinds of insight into star formation and how that process actually it's works. It's going to keep people working for years just on this one. <laughs> yeah. this one this on this one, one image, this yeah. is a thesis of in and of its own. Yeah, so. <laughs> no, it's amazing. So, so we're going to find out so much more about how stars form, why they form, where they form, what which sizes form where, how do they interact with that environment around them and with each other. We're going to we're going to we're going to find out so much more. And again, that's one of the uh, 
hitting one of the nails on the head with the uh, with the uh, with the science goals, understanding that 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 birth of stars in this uh, in this uh, in this nebula. So that's that's really amazing. And and another beautiful thing that you said is having these different wavelengths. You immediately see different things, right? So you, yeah. that and and that's the that's the power. And we're going to see that in in some of the other images as well. So um, maybe if we move on to the, I think one that you might really like as a as a planetary scientist, WASP ninety six B. So what WASP is a, an exoplanet, right? It's um so it's a planet giant planet outside our solar system consisting mainly of gas. Obviously, this is a, an artist's impression. We don't we don't have a photograph like this. And it's located about 1,150 light years away, orbits its star about once every 3.5 uh, 3.5 days, and it has about half the mass of Jupiter. So, why are we so interested in WASP 96b? What's the what's the deal here? So um, this one was put on the short list as one of our early targets, mm. um, just because we felt like because it has such a puffy atmosphere, mm. it is huge and it has a very short period. Um, we didn't have to dwell on it forever mm. to watch the yeah. full transit. We didn't um, have to really concentrate and get a lot of um, orbits uh, to build up the signal to noise to actually mm. characterize the atmosphere. Um, it turned out to be a beautiful uh, first spectrum to have mm. of an exoplanet. Um, a lot of information came out of the spectrum that um, we weren't expecting and we didn't have any, uh, we didn't even know. Um, so one of the main things is, is the water is very prominent. Yeah. Um, you yeah. can, even a layman can look at you and tell you that there's bumps and wiggles going across this um, spectrum. Uh, you know, peaks and valleys, which all indicate that there is a presence of water vapor. So, so, so is this, this, is this a vibrational atmosphere. modes um, yes. spectrograph? Yes. Is, that, mm -hmm. is that what it is? Okay. Yes. So um, this is sort of a, a very prominent mode of water um, as far as the spectra goes. Um, very easy to observe. Um, this is the first time we've actually observed beyond um, the, I think, 1.7, 1.75. I, I, I think you're right. I've got, I've got the the old one, which I think was from HST. So yeah, yeah. Once we've got up to sort of 1.7, it sort of goes fuzzy. Yeah, yeah. So this is the first um, what we'll call near infrared um, spectrum of an exoplanet, which is fantastic. It's brilliant. Um, it does start getting a little bit noisier over there, but that's mm. okay. Um, yeah. We are expecting that, and it's just something. You know, these exoplanet observations are really, really hard to do. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something a lot of people don't really grasp um, in the general public. Uh, my best comparison that I can give anybody is we actually watch planets transit in front of the sun. We yeah. see Venus yeah. transit. Um, we have beautiful images of Venus transiting in front of the sun. And I challenge you to look at the Venus transit <laughs> images and tell me that you can identify an atmosphere. It is nowhere near anything we can see with the human eye. And we know Venus has a really dense atmosphere. We know <laughs> we know how big the atmosphere and, and is. And it's really we, close in terms of- And it's right yeah, there. Yeah. And, we, and you cannot see it. You cannot resolve it in those images of Venus passing in front of the sun um, with all the detail that we have and as big as it is compared to um, looking at planets around other stars. So whenever you see something like a spectrum of a planet going in front of its star, I just go back to that imagery of mm -hmm. Venus passing in front of the sun and think how hard it must be to just look at an atmosphere of one of these tiny little objects going in front of its star. So, so um, the idea here is that the, the, the planet passes in front of the star. We, we, we kind of know it's there from the from the transit, but we, what we would really want to get is the light that passes through the even yeah. thinner atmosphere as it sort of touches the edge of the disc. Uh, and you can imagine, uh, well, what we'll get then is certain, certain light will be absorbed, certain light will be emitted, and then hopefully we can see those those characteristics of different molecules. But you've got this raging ball of fire behind <laughs> light. How do, you, how do you separate the two out? It's a really difficult technical challenge to be able to do that. And yet, yet, We've managed to do it, or you guys have managed to do it for something yep. that's 1,150 this... light years away and work out what's in the atmosphere of that uh, of that thing. And it turns out there's water there, which is uh, beyond amazing. Yeah, 
Um, and there's other things there as well. Um, and this is something, you know, I'm sure everybody's going to go back to this object now and, and observe it in multiple transit uh, just to pin down that signal to noise and really try to understand what's going on. It, it's funny in the, the social media community, you can already see the exoplanet scientists are trying to do analysis on this data just from that image of a spectrum. Yeah. Um, so it's really it's really impressive, the, the enthusiasm and motivation from the, the community to already start digging into these data. I've already seen I people think, saying, oh, it doesn't doesn't look like it quite fits at the lower end there. And uh, yeah, the, yeah. Usu the usual uh, the usual discussions you get around <laughs> the uh, the scientific table. Well, I want to know a little bit more about that. I believe the um, the, the raw data, uh, if it hasn't already come today, is coming. So people will be able to, yeah, to kind of dig yeah. into this as well and uh, do their uh, do their peer review off more than uh, just kind of <laughs> eyeballing something, which is always a usually, Twitter review. Yeah, usually a bad idea to. Uh, <laughs> To jump on scientists just having uh, looked at one one particular graph. So that's uh, that's absolutely amazing. And I guess the idea with the science here is we can get an idea of of the the composition, those molecules, and maybe get an idea of of what these planets are made of, and therefore how they came to be. What sort of um, elements are in these planets as a function of proximity to their stars, and what sort of systems they're in? Is this is this kind of the idea? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we have this, you know, huge ambition um, in the whole field of exoplanet science to find Earth 2.0. Yeah. You know, that's the goal. Um, so finding a planet that's close enough to its star that um, it can have liquid water, because if it gets too close, then it, it vaporizes and becomes just gaseous. If it's too far away, it freezes out and, you know, is an, an inaccessible chemical um, for a lot of um, needs for things like life or biology. So um, having liquid water is sort of what we dubbed the Goldilocks zone. And so um, really studying planets that are in that region and seeing what the composition of their atmospheres, if they have them, mm. actually is. But there's a lot more that we can learn about studying the atmospheres of planets around other stars. I mean, there's look at the variety we have of atmospheres just in our own solar system. So, 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 so. even even that the atmospheres in the solar system and this when I was when I was looking through was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. I'm sure you've seen this. Oh, yeah. I the love variety this. of exoplanets is just absolutely and completely bonkers. It's like we why do they form like this? When do they form like this? Why sometimes are they huge? Why sometimes are they small? What's yeah. the uh, population distribution of these things? There's so many still open questions. It's just absolutely nuts on the uh, in terms of diversity of the uh, the exoplanets that we've seen. So there's a uh, there's a hell of a lot of work to be done to understand um, all of these uh, all of these uh, exoplanets. Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. Um, and and even more importantly, um, while the Earth 2.0 is um, a, a key goal for some people, um, it's not the ultimate end all goal. Mm -hmm. Look at how Earth itself, how our atmosphere on Earth has actually evolved since the formation of Earth. You know, we've gone through heavy bombardment periods. We've lost our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, we've gone through ice ages. We've gone through um, early biology to late biology to technology. Um, we've had, you know, extreme conditions um, just in our atmosphere alone. So you have to remember when we're looking at planets around other stars, who knows what period of the evolution of that planet we're actually looking at at that glimpse of time. Yeah. So um, understanding what that process actually looks like. I think the key thing that um, is the most scientifically compelling from my perspective is just looking for things that are irregular in those yeah. atmospheres. Yeah. Um, seeing whether or not there's, there's different molecules that are present that shouldn't be there together. Yeah. And maybe that's because there's things like volcanoes um, maybe it's because it has gone through a heavy bombardment phase, um, or maybe it's actually something like biology. Um, these are the keys that we're actually looking for to get our short list, you know, of our top, mm. our favorite exoplanets that we're going to be studying <laughs> with, you know, the next generation spacecraft or observatory. So um, it's going to be a really exciting time for, for science in this field. And, you know, the James Webb Space Telescope is just going to 
the clean up <laughs> per se, you know, what, what, we, what we can see and what we know about these objects. I think you might go through sort of a, a period like we did in particle physics in the 50s and 60s, where it's sort of Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize, <laughs> discovery after discovery after discovery. It's going to be an absolutely um, fascinating time. So it, we, we move on to the sort of penultimate one. The, uh, the, the sort of next one that came up was this, this Southern Ring Nebula. So this is, this is with Hubble. And then if we go to the um, the JWST, JWST images, excuse me, we can see in much, much more detail. I don't know if you've seen this. There's a, a chap called, uh, I think it's John Christian, has produced these kind of slide sideways. Uh, yeah, yeah, images. I love this. Yeah. I love it. I, I was going <laughs> to do this like on Premiere Pro with it just dissolved from one to another. And then he made this and I was like, yeah, I'm just not going to bother now. I'm just going to uh, retweet yeah. his because it's such a... Such, yeah. a, such an amazing <laughs> job that he's done with uh, there's so much talent in the uh, in the community and they just jump on it straight away and uh, produce these beautiful things. So what are we what what are we seeing here? I guess uh, this is hitting the nail of of stellar death. Is that is that right? Yes. Yes. So this is um, a star, you know, gasping its last few breaths of air. <laughs> Um, so the fun part about this particular object is um, it's actually a binary. So we have a dying star and it has a younger star that's actually present with it. So on the right hand image, which is the mid infrared image, we can actually see the two stars uh, distinctly. So the one that is blown off all this material that's created this beautiful nebula that we see is the red one, ah. which is really, really hard to see at shorter wavelengths. Mm. Um, now, you can argue that maybe it's lost in the PSF of the, the near infrared image there. Um, Is it because it's cooling down, star. so it's less hot and you, you can only it's see it? It's very dusty. In the, right, yeah. Okay. So they're, they're cooler, they're dusty, mm -hmm. they're, they're losing all their material. Um, so they've evolved to this, to the red giant phase, and now they're extending beyond that red giant phase. Mm -hmm. So that red giant phase is when all that mass and material just starts coming off of the mm -hmm. star. Um, and basically, this is when we say that, you know, our sun is going to swallow the Earth someday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is beyond that period. So this is after all the planets have been swallowed by the, the giant star in the center. Yeah. Um, but it's also um, fantastic because now the star has lost enough of that material and it's been pushed away from it, which is why we see these beautiful arcs and structures mm -hmm. um, surrounding it, that now that center star is turning into a white dwarf and it's mm -hmm. lighting up all of this gas and dust around it. Mm -hmm. And that's what gives us these beautiful um, planetary nebula. Because that light yeah. is sort of being, being uh, not fully trapped, but sort of bounced back and forth inside. Yeah, that, that so now it's hitting bubble. all that gas yeah. and dust and, and re-irradiating. So mm. that's why we see them as beautiful nebula. Um, I, I love this image. The detail, uh, yeah. again, if you blow it up and just look at, again, the Hubble image compared to what we can mm. see with um, the James Webb, the, the level of detail and the complexity of this object but, yeah. is just mind blowing. Um, you see filament structure, you see light that's actually getting mm. Um, in and around all the nooks and crevices and um, really pulling out <laughs> the nitty gritty of uh, a dying star. Uh, this is fantastic image. I love it. And what's even more mind blowing is look at the background, <laughs> yeah, all the yeah. galaxies. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Paul pointed this out to me. He's like, uh, oh, yeah. And by the way, there's just uh, just happens to be another galaxy sort of chilling edge on in the uh, in the corner. I was like, that hadn't even noticed that and if you zoom in yeah. you can yeah you can sort of see all this there stuff in the background that you never even that you never even noticed so uh yeah just totally ridiculous and I, and I guess because we can because we can see so far out because we can take data so quickly we can we can start to build up a huge population of these things start to understand their behavior understand the patterns understand how they interact um it, you know when you have different star systems and and really sort of build up a, a a set of data where we can start to understand these things better. Absolutely. It's, um, yeah, we're rewriting the textbooks already. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody said to me yesterday when they were, when they were watching one of the, one of the streams, they said, we're literally watching scientific history being written in, in, in real time. We, and we really are, there's going to be so much comes out. I'm waiting for the, uh, you've obviously had the, 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 the sort of science performance paper up on archive already. I'm waiting for the, the first ones to sort of hit archive soon. I imagine they'll be uh, they'll be flying out very very soon. Oh yeah, 
that data is gonna hit and I'm guessing here comes the science. Yeah, get ready. <laughs> it's the same after we turned on the LHC, it was just like, boom, here come all the papers. So yeah, the, the yes. final one um, that we can <clears throat> that we can discuss is this uh, <sighs> Stefan's, Stefan's Quintet. So this is about 290 million light years away in Pegasus. Um, and we've known about it since the 80, uh, since 1877, the first compact galaxy group. So I think four of them are together. And then this this one up in the top left is sort of in the front closer to us. But it but it looks superimposed on the sky like it's a, yeah. like it's a beautiful quintet, five five of them. So I guess here we're, we're, we're hitting that that goal of understanding how galaxies evolve and understanding how they develop, because Michelle was saying yesterday galaxies back in the past they don't look like the galaxies we have today so we want to understand how did we get from the very old to the the spiral armed galaxies that we have today we, we again you would think that we know but we're not we're not too sure at the moment exactly um this the one that you're showing right now this mid infrared image of the of the quintet is is my favorite okay, that we've good. released um i one of the folks that um, was working on these data uh, told me that they like to call this the gem <laughs> um, because of all the colors. I love it. Um, what is most spectacular and notable about this image is if you go to that top galaxy, um, you can actually see plumes of gas and dust that are being sucked into the black hole of that yeah. galaxy. Um, that's crazy. That's <laughs> And, and, and obviously that black hole we know has a, it's going to have a great impact on the evolution. We have one, the center of our galaxy. We've, we've seen the beautiful picture of it recently from the, uh, from the, uh, from the huge telescope. I forget the, the horizon. Event horizon. Um, yeah. Event horizon telescope. That's right. Um, so we need to understand how those black holes behave as well. And even with JWST in its first couple of days, we've managed to, uh, to see the, the gas and dust swirling around the black hole and even, uh, more amazingly, get the composition of that that gas and dust as well. So exactly, we know yeah, exactly what's is... in it, <laughs> and more than that, we know how fast the damn thing is going around the uh, around the black hole by looking at the uh, I guess the red shifts of the uh, of the material velocity the lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the the most spectacular part about the James Webb Space Telescope and the instrumentation that we have is it is three dimensional. We have imaging with complementary spectra. So you can think almost every pixel you can see has a spectra associated with it. And so we can really pull out all the details, the physics, the dynamics, the composition of all of these objects in, in ways that we've never been able to do before. Um, with these wavelengths, um, it gives us telltale signs of, you know, um, whether or not water is in a planetary atmosphere, um, whether or not carbon dioxide is in a comet, um, how star formation uh, promotes and, and maybe um, inhibits uh, molecular complexity as new planets are forming. Um, we can study the atomic lines of galaxies across the galaxy, uh, across the universe. Um, what, what are my, one, of my, one of my favorite ones from the spectra, sorry to sorry to jump in, was that yep. usually we, we, we're not too sure when they're when they're matching up these gravitational lens galaxies. It, is this a copy of this or is it or is it something else? Which ones match up now? You just go spectra, please. Spectra, please. Oh, they're the same. Yeah, those are fine. And, and you can just map out this lens beautifully because you have, as you said, the spectra associated with each of these pixels. And, and now it's not a. It's not a guessing game. It's not. It's not a visible light game of trying to match these pieces together. You just go, "Can I have the spectrum, please? Can I have the spectrum, please?" Yeah. Oh, there's yeah, and we get it all at once. Um, so it's not like um, previous uh, instruments or um, observatories where you have to get time to use a certain teles a certain telescope and a certain instrument, and uh, maybe you want to do multiple instruments to so get spectra and an image. But those usually aren't done at the same time, and you have to make sure that they're done um, consecutively. Or, or maybe you get the image and you're like, "Oh, here's this, you know, lens uh, galaxy. I wonder if they're the same." So then you have to propose and get more time to use a spectrometer so you can go back and analyze it. This is a, a wham bam, thank you, ma'am. You get it all, uh, all for one, and it's fantastic. Um, I, I'm. 
yeah, I'm giddy at the thought of the science that we're going to see over the next, like I said, just think this was a blink of an eye for web and uh, we're already doubled the amount of data. We're going to triple it um, in the next day. And then, you know, it's just an exponential growth considering how much information comes out of one observation. I, I'm I'm so excited to, to, to see what comes out over the next, even over the next cu couple of weeks, never mind the next year as people sort of get their, <laughs> get their hands on this and and see what's going on. And, and like I said back at the start, I think this is a beautiful selection of images because not only are they beautiful for people to see, but for the scientists, the amount of things that you've done in such a short space of time as well is just absolutely mind blowing. And the, and the way that they feed in to those huge science goals, people are gonna be studying this data for, for, for absolutely years. It's absolutely um, amazing. What can we expect? So just as we sort of close up on this, thank you so much for, for going through those with me. I don't know if this is the Jupiter image that you that you it mentioned. Is. It is. So we've uh, we've got some some more stuff that's going to be coming out in the uh, in the next sort of couple of days. So we'll, we'll keep our ear to the grounds for that. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions to uh, to close up um, because I want to don't want to take up too much more of your time. My question to you is uh, two questions. One, <clears throat> what would you want to point web at first if you were completely in control? What would be the first thing that you want to know more about? I've heard a lot of people talking about Trappist One and wanting to point it there. Where would uh, where would you want to point first if you were uh, in charge of web? Well. Um... I think I have a lot of bias because I do. That's okay. Have I've, I've cycle invited one program. that with this question. That's okay. <laughs> Don't worry. I do have cycle one programs um, that are planned, and um, some of them are actually already starting their observations. Amazing. So, um, but what I'm most passionate about and what I'm the most excited about is the the study of interstellar objects. Mm. Um, which there isn't one in the sky right now. So um, obviously we can't point it, point at it first um, because we don't have one to point at. Um, but as soon as one's discovered, all hands are on deck and we're going to, to point the James Webb Space Telescope towards that interstellar object and do a full compositional study. So whether or not it looks like the crazy Oumuamua cigar yeah. spaceship asteroid thing, or whether or not it looks like Borzov and more cometary, um, Either way, we're ready for it. And this telescope can do the analysis, the detailed compositional studies that no other facility has been able to do because of its sensitivity and because of the wavelength coverage that we have. So I think that is going to be um, a really exciting science finding when we get our next interstellar object. Um, but one of the things I'm really, really excited to start seeing what the, the web telescope will do as far as solar system science goes, mm. because that's, you know, my job, mm. um, is the study of ocean worlds. Yeah. So actually getting our hands on de details of what, you know, the, the composition of the plumes are coming from Europa or Enceladus. Mm. Um, we have ideas, we have hints, but we'll get the full detailed compositional information with web in ways that we haven't been able to do. And this is this is really key. This is important for the Europa Clipper mission. Yep. Um, yep. Getting that preliminary information is gonna help refine the instrumentation that we take on missions to these, um, to these satellites um, or even other systems. So I think um, Webb is really gonna enable a lot of science return from planned missions, future missions, and maybe even the analysis and interpretation of past missions. So um, I'm really looking forward to and excited to the complementary nature of what we can do with the James Webb Space Telescope and planetary science. That that was one of the uh, the questions that came up came up in the chat was was who's allowed to get time on it? I guess that the time has already been booked out by scientists for for kind of the next year. I remember people sort of applying for time on it kind of six months ago, probably probably a lot more than that to to look at various things. I guess it's all kind of booked out now because you have to think about where it's going to be in the sky relative to the sun, where we can look, as you mentioned, with, with looking for these uh, these beautiful preliminary images. It's not just a case of you can look at anything whenever you want. It's uh, you have to sort of get in the queue and, uh, you know, wait your turn and also for to be the right place in the sky to be able to observe whatever you want to observe. 
Yeah, so we have um, what's called an annual call for proposals. And so we only schedule about a year of a time, year at a time worth of observations. And that's so there's a competitive process that comes in that's peer reviewed um, by, by the science community. It's not even people that work on the project. It's the entire science community review and rank these proposals. So anybody in the world could propose for time. Um, and I highly encourage folks to do so. Um, and hopefully with our 20 year mission lifetime, we're gonna not only get to all the objects that we currently know and want to study, mm. but think of all the possibility of all the discovery yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's very exciting to think about what's gonna be happening. But yes, the first year of science is already planned. We even have a temporary schedule um, already aligned for the first year. So folks already have a good idea of when their observations mm. are gonna happen. Um, this is crazy times. <laughs> we're, we're already planning for the next call for proposals, which will come out later this year. So um, that'll be like November, I believe, um, of this year. And the proposals are due in early 23. So um, second year science planning is already <laughs> getting, you know, formulated in scientists' heads. <laughs> it, never, it never stops. But as you said, we might find some truly amazing stuff and that might all get dropped and we want to... Uh... We want to look at something else. My my final question, and I haven't had a chance to ask this this question to anyone, and it, it's kind of not science related. It's more sort of pop culture related. Do you think that JWST will become a kind of pop culture icon like like Hubble has come before it? You know, when the when the aliens turn up in a film, they blow up Hubble. When you ask someone around the world, name me a telescope. Oh, Hubble Space Telescope. People put it on on logos. They put it on, you know, you know, business cards and things like this. Do you think that over the sort of next 15, 20 years over the lifetime of Webb, it will become that that pop culture sort of icon and sort of transcend out of science to be something that that people are more aware of outside? Um, absolutely. If it hasn't already, mm. um, I think the excitement of the observatory is has already filled the air, um, especially with the release of these images in the last few days. Um, the general public's enthusiasm that we've seen through social media, through interactions, you know, outreach events, um, talking to my family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, everybody's absolutely ecstatic and can't wait to see the, the possibilities that we're, we have now in front of us with the, the web telescope. So I think, yes, absolutely. And, you know, folks have been already, you know, bantering about the James Webb Space Telescope for years now. So now that we're getting data and actual science in hand and we're, we're in a safe, um, beautiful orbit and collecting data, I think it's only going to improve. And you, you say talking to your parents, my, my mom is really not, not, not into science at all. And, and even she was like, you've seen these images, they're amazing. And I was like, that's when you know that this is a, a really, really <laughs> impactful thing. Exactly. Stephanie, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. I really appreciate it, especially because you must be so busy and got so much of this to do. Really beautiful breakdown. Uh, I think everyone's really enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed it. I learned even more about these fantastic images and I'm really, really excited to see what comes over the uh, over the next few weeks and over the next year. It's going to be an absolute quantum shift in our in our understanding of the universe and I, and I can't wait to... Uh, to see where that takes us. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. I will make sure that all of your um, your work and your, your details, your socials and such are down in the description. So uh, head over there and look on uh, Stephanie's Twitter, which has some beautiful stuff on there and, and information about what's going on. Is there anywhere else you'd like to, to guide people to, uh, to, to uh, know more about web and, and what's going on over the next year? jwst.nasa.gov. Um, is my go-to. And of course, if you Google JWST, you're going to find everything. And actually, the Google Doodle was JWST. I don't know if you got to see that yesterday. Yes, but, um, yeah, yeah. So is it transcending the, uh, the the culture again? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so um, all hands on deck for sure. Uh, Everybody is ready and geared up and excited. So um, please follow along. I, I do have to say that the, the outreach from from NASA and everyone, all the scientists there and all the outreach personnel there. I, I, I've never had a, an easier and a better and a, and a more 
fruitful and learning experience than dealing with um, with how you guys have been putting this out to the world. It's been absolutely fantastic. So keep up the amazing work and, and keep on telling people about it because it's a, a really brilliant way to get people excited, bring people together and put them all on the same footing and learning more about the universe. It's been absolutely brilliant. And uh, I can't uh, I can't give you a more more plaudits than a just absolutely amazing. Superb. I will pass that along to our outreach team. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. The, the tech didn't go so good, but I, I don't blame them that. I said, uh, I said, hopefully it will stay on uh, that side of things on the live stream and it won't happen with the telescope. So we can, uh, we can have a few glitches on the live stream. Stephanie, I'm going to let you go because I want to, I want to respect your time. You must be very, very busy. Thank you once again. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can chat again. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Have a lovely evening. Bye now.